ladies and gentlemen, I'm back from horror, <laughs> and uh, I have a wonderful book uh, to talk about. Uh, even though I'm the translator, I can still say it's a wonderful book because I am translating uh, an extraordinary thing by a wonderful person. The book I will be uh, talking about tonight is Xi Jing, which is just uh, Chinese for Book of Songs. Okay. China's earliest verse anthology. And to make for the most convenient uh, introduction, with the least stumbling and fumbling, I wrote off, out my introductory paragraph explaining what I think is most important. And the first and most important thing is the title, Speaking with the Chinese. That's the title of my uh, uh, 33rd episode of the uh, 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 Believing rather, sorry, beloving huh, imaginer. I invented that word beloving uh, in, in the pres present uh, tense participle form. Uh, and I, it's hard for me sometimes to remember that it even exists. Mm -hmm. Speaking with the Chinese, and that's carefully phrased. And the theme is going to be interior conversation. Friedrich Rückert, you can uh, pronounce that Rückert in English if you want, Com completed in 1833 his 325 poems, adaptations he called them, of the poems in the earliest collection of Chinese verse that we have, an anonymous work composed by pre-Confucian poets from the 11th to the 4th centuries BCE. This is really a long time ago. Just to judge uh, for a bit of relative gauging of time, uh, Confucius, the famous teacher of uh, China, uh, lived in the 4 and 500 BCE, and this doesn't go any um, uh, more recent than the 600s. Uh, it's ac actually a... Uh, uh, no, from the eleventh to the to the uh, just a second to the seventh century. That's a typo. From the eleventh to the seventh, and Confucius is in the four and five hundreds. We are way, way before Confucius. We don't go past uh, seven hundred BCE. Now, Rückert, though he had learned forty-four languages, and maybe I should stop right there and tell you how I got that fact. <laughs> okay. This giant book, can you see it well? Uh, the Welt Poet? Der, Der Welt Poet. Okay. That's it. Der Welt Poet. It means the world poet. Friedrich Rucker, 1788 to 1866, poet, orientalist, zeit critic, um, uh, cultural critic. Uh, and in this book, which is written by 32 people, all of whom have copyrights to their several uh, uh, contributions. It's several hundred pages long, uh, and I bought it in Rückert's own hometown of Coburg in Germany, where I got to stay oh. overnight in his very own house, really? uh, which is now a museum, but they're treating mm -hmm. the upstairs rooms as, uh, yeah, they're treating it as part of the museum. They are, um, the whole house is, is an exhibit of how he lived, except for the kitchen, maybe a couple of other rooms. But if you go up to the, to the uh, attic, uh, you have the what would have been, I guess, the, the rooms for the servants. And a friend of mine and I uh, got to stay in the rooms up there, uh, oh, slept sleeping overnight in the home of the poet. And then we got to go downstairs and uh, I got to go into his study, the poet's own study. Mm -hmm. around, still has scraps of paper floating around with, wow. words from, with words from foreign and very strange and unknown to me, languages floating around. And he had a, a, a desk and I thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful. I even uh, dreamed about it before going to the house in Coburg, how nice it would be to write a poem at the poet's own desk. That's impossible. He was close to uh, being as tall as Abraham Lincoln. He, he used a standing desk. There's no way oh. I could reach that to write. Yeah, anything. yeah. <laughs> but I did have a wonderful time there. I, uh, the Klaus und, und Christel Rückert, the descendants of the poet, have a love for music. Uh, Rückert himself is one of the greatest folks, uh, shall we say, word song, musical, lyrical verse writers that ever lived. But there are no musicians in the family, and I happen to play the violin. So I was called upon for fiddle tunes with every meal. So I had a very oh, good time nice. doing that. It was a delightful 
delightful experience. Now, uh, this is the, the, the German source book that I use. Let's see, I'll open up to a couple of good sample pages. Here, how about this? Can you see all right? Mm. Well, I see that, but I can't see well enough to read it. Of course, well, it might know, be in, it, in German, probably. So then it's all it. in German anyway. But if you could see it well enough to yeah. read as much as you wanted, you would still have have some work to do because every page of it is written in the old Gothic type font, which was oh. used in, for everything that Rückert wrote that I can discover in the uh, original publications. And I was never taught to read it. So I, I have taught myself how to read it. And I'm oh. pretty good at it, but I'm not going to use it tonight because... Um, well, I thought of reading a few things from the original German, but it's very hard to get up dramatic verve and fervor when you get stopped any time yes. an unfamiliar <laughs> letter. That's that's not a help. So um, I think I'm just about ready to. Oh, I didn't. Okay, I just bought the Shai Jing on Kindle. Yeah, Shai Jing. Ah, Jing. Book of Songs. Yes. Now, where's my. Here we are. Let's try this again. Friedrich Rickert completed his adaptations of poems in the earliest collection of Chinese verse that we have, an anonymous work composed by pre-Confucian poets from the 11th to the 7th centuries BCE. Rickert, though he had learned 44 languages, didn't know any more Chinese than I do. But he did have the recently discovered prose translation in Latin published by La Charme, a Jesuit priest, uh, in 1733, I call my recital of these English translations of mine speaking with the Chinese because the poems Rickert offers feel to me like, and this is my key phrase, mm -hmm. I want to keep constantly in mind, interior conversations with the Chinese fictive speakers. He's reading this in Latin prose, and prose means ordinary conversational writing, as if you're going to read the newspaper or a, a, a news report on your computer screen or a magazine. Uh, uh, how is that going to convey poetry? Not very well, unless you happen to be a great poet as well as a great scholar and a highly intuitive reader, but you aren't going to get the uh, the lyrical forms of the original, whatever they may have been, because you're not hearing any Chinese words. So Rückert made up his own forms. The poets who lived centuries ago and are alive through their poems speak or more precisely sing their poetic word songs to the German listener and to each of these memorable people of ancient China, he replies by turning their prose utterances, given by the Latin priest, into German poems in forms he invents to fit the feelings they convey to him. I'm happy to report to you that this proved to be a best-selling book. And uh, it, one yeah. of the people that it inspired is the man who did the translation, translated lyrics uh, from the Chinese uh, for that Mahler used in his Song of the Earth, Das Lied oh, von der Erde. Yes, that's part of the Chinese song, word song fad started uh, uh, or at least uh, initiated in the biggest possible way uh, by Rückert in 1843. Oh. So the turn of the century, 19th into the 20th, was, a, was quite a time for reading uh, in Western languages, Chinese verse. And Rucker thought he had done a really important deed for Western culture because he was the first person to translate these uh, into a modern language, a modern European language. And it brought them alive. He even begins the book with a poem where he tells about how the spirits of the poems begged him to, uh, to uh, allow them to transmigrate from their other underworldly state and acquire new bodies with which to face the modern world. Mm. It's a very beautiful poem. But I've done a presentation on this book before, and I read that poem then, so we're not going to deal with it tonight. We're going okay. to move instead right immediately into ancient Chinese life. And uh, as part of our introduction, let's turn to page 158, in case you or anyone else happens to have this. No, you, you don't, because you just ordered it. Yeah, well, I have it on Kindle, that's why I should, should have it. All right. Uh, Poem number 158 is called, because I wanted to introduce you to everyday details of Chinese. Yes, yes. Pages from a household calendar. Okay. In spring, when days are getting long, the maiden 
will take her braided basket fair to see, and pluck some leaves till the container's laden with food for silkworms on the berry tree. In summer, when the colored blooms reach wider, the wife will take the dyes like flowers outspread, and clothes will bloom for servant, reaper, rider, and for the prince, the brightest hue of red. In autumn, when from trees that shade the walks, the leaves are falling, men will hunting go. The prince will don his finest pelt of fox, which he at royal court will love to show. In winter, when the storms through heaven sweep, to trap wild boars will soldiers boldly try. The piglets for themselves they'll get to keep. The prince will have the roasted joint of thigh. It's amusing and interesting, isn't it? Yes. No matter what you do with whatever product you you produce or or, or call forth, uh, you tell what the king gets and what the prince gets. You never yeah. are supposed to forget who would want to that you're living in the great Chinese empire. Part two. This, in sixth month, will the crickets wake in field? And summer music then begins in choir. In seventh, louder songs will have appealed. In eighth, a house invasion they'll desire. Uh, yeah, I know that about that in where, right where I live. Right. In ninth, they enter as through open door. In tenth, beneath the bed they slide with ease. Then come the storms of autumn that with roar will lift the roof and rattle balconies. Mend gaping holes and fix what sprung awry and stop the cracks wherever they might be. With spells and fumigation, low and high, smoke out each mouse and let the house breathe free. Part three. Yes. I'm giving you a thorough house cleaning here. Well, yeah, and I have it right here. <laughs> I'm glad. So I can follow along, yeah. Each ninth month in our orchard, there will be set up arrangements for a threshing floor. In tenth, the varied sorts of grain will be, be bringing up in separate bins to pour. All different types of rice, and then of maize, and then of millet, and of beans and peas, of lentils, wheat, both white and black, we raise. You farmers here, observe it, if you please. You that so perfectly have cultivated the summer field, come see our winter house, and in unwearied fellowship elated, your energies for lighter work arouse. The tasks are well distributed, I hope. You, first the wood in early morning move. You, later, make at night the cords and rope. You climb the wall, the weakened roof improve. You'll all head toward the mountain, ice to get, to cool the prince, the heated summer through. By sunrise, all the coal aside will set. Then work is waiting in the fields for you. <laughs> well, he makes it all sound like a festival, but it's a whole yes. lot work for everybody. Yes. And I remember reading that before the 20th century, almost everyone worked in agriculture. Yes. Yes. And we're in very, very far back centuries. Yes. Now let's try a little expansion on the theme. Uh, that There we got the master of the household doling out the chores. Mm -hmm. uh, here, here we have a, a perhaps slightly uh, lower class member. Uh, this is simply called the farmer. It's poem 234. Bigger field will mean the worries grow. Farm equipment, good when last you saw. Sheltered in the winter shed, we know. Bring it out, examine every flaw. Steer and stall can feel, it's here again. Breath of spring and welcomed with a roar. Up, go get the steers, be using them now to do what they're created for. Want to clean the plow from year old rust? Push it deep to meet the waiting soil. Now the ground to feel renewal must glad with gratitude the hard crust foil. Throw into the wind the well-sieved seed. Breeze will straightway scatter it with glee. When the seeds to furrows it will lead, it can by the harrow buried be. 
Soon the heaven-wafted winds from earth will entice the well-kept wealth to shine. Little holes to cradles turn, and worth unconstrained comes forth to light divine. Little tips poke up, each blade will sprout. Marrowy, the wheat grains shoot their way. Just be sure you're always clearing out anything that would their growth gainsay. Anything with roots that rob the food plants require by heavy alien weight. Climbing things that wind in true invaders rude, round the stalks and healthy growth abate. Things with wide and shadow making leaf that the life can stifle in the shoot. Things with poison causing wheat seed grief, rot aggressively attacking root. But the spreading, crawling, peril making, things that gnaw the sprout to leaf adhere, effort barely stirs, the mold awaking, self willed parasitic power we fear. What against that plague is our defense? call upon the spirit on whose care crops of all our fields depend for thence ills are smitten fire heat comes from there let him pour from cloudy urns on seed what will make them fertile flourishing water let him guide i beg him heed such a blessing first unto the king next let rain come down on smaller places, like the one on which my home depends, nor neglect the border crop in spaces, food alms giving to our poorer friends. Don't forget to feed the birds and the chipmunks if they have, <laughs> if they have them in China. That's nice to think it's alms for the birds. Mm -hmm. Reaper, leave these stems and stalks alone. Binder of the sheaves, please let them lie. Let the widows glean from what is grown, what they need when they are stopping by. Wow. Was this different poets the writing about? Absolutely. Different, different people. Okay. It could be that sometimes the same poet wrote uh, uh, two, two or more of the adjacent poems. Maybe the, those last two were written by the same guy. They might well be. But, mm -hmm. they, but we don't know. These are anonymous poems, and scholars have made their whole career trying to figure out who wrote what and when, and what he did and why. It's uh, quite a manual. It's pretty much like this is how you do it. Yes, yes. You learn a lot about everything, about, yeah. uh, about agriculture. Uh, you, you learn about um, uh, construction. Let's try a, a piece okay. from, from the construction trade. Uh, this would be poem 55. Uh, that would be, uh, if you're doing Kindle, poem 135, uh, page 135. Okay. The building of the royal house. Little foot, uh, uh, intro po note here. Wen Kong, Wei Kong, sorry, Wen Kong, whose father Yi Kong, Prince of Wei, was slain in battle by northern barbarians, now moved robbed of his realm into the land of Chu, where he established a new reign, 660 BCE. So, uh, so I have the wrong number. Which number is it again? I'm sorry, number 55. 55, oh, I'm sorry. Five, five. Yeah. Yes, now it's interesting here. Uh, this is a king apparently recently conquered by the emperor. The, emperor, the empire acquires new provinces all the time uh, and subsidiary kingdoms. Uh, and this, this man is praised for his industrious labors in becoming uh, an, uh, a responsible part of the Chinese empire. So let's uh, watch the house being built for this king. Okay. As Ting, the star of home construction, filled at the meridian a favored place, folk now began the royal house to build in Chu, that meadows rich in water grace. The die when cast confirmed the prospect sought. The shadow lengths were measured with dispatch. A southward facing entry would be wrought and trees be planted that would breezes match. What comes into my mind here from the modern point of view is feng shui. 
This is oh, Chinese, Chinese yeah. geomancy, yes? yes? Everything is worked out, whether by scientific or by magical or astrological means or by some combination of the three. Yes. The trees that blossom will be planted here, and here are the ones that yield abundant fruit. Here those where juicy olives will appear, and here are the ones that silkworms well may suit. And here are the ones from which the tablet wood is hewn, whereon the records will be writ. And here are the ones from which the craftsmen could make instruments for banquet music fit. Now let us deeds achieve that merit fame, and both of peace and war perform the dances. For foes now quiet, if too great their claim, will feel from lavish forest battle lances. Our sovereign three thousand steeds will serve with grandeur, each one seven feet in height. At war call ready troops will ride with verve, who match redoubtable the horse's might. Hmm. Not seven feet in height. <laughs> well, I'm maybe. sorry. Sorry? Not seven feet in height. Well, maybe. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> because he's going from maybe the head to the toe. Yeah. They must not have been as short as modern day Chinese. No, no listen, 3,000 steeds will serve. Hmm. Each one seven. Oh, you're talking about the horses. Yes, yeah. That would be tall horses, wouldn't they? Well, I guess. That I think I can picture it. Yeah. Can too. Well, let's try another another aspect of Chinese life. And that is if you're going to have a big manorial, a house with, a, with extensive farms and uh, various sharecroppers of different kinds and seasonal workers, uh, you're going to need a steward to oversee it. So here is poem 233. Okay. 233, and that's page 362. Got it? Um, got it? Well, I got competition of doing the steward. That's the one. We want okay. the steward. This is a fun piece. Okay. Uh, whoever these farmers are are very happy. <laughs> when the steward treads the field, plowmen's work to supervise, wives and children unconcealed bring along the food supplies that on southern fields require workers whom their labors chire. Grateful they for helpers' friendly eyes. When he needs no more to see, finding everything is right, hungry then he too will be, tasting dishes with delight. Added to the ripened seeds are the other foods he'll ne he needs, both he'll praise with gladsome face and bright. Let alone the mattock, ho, from your forehead wipe the sweat, wheat and barley well you grow, groats and rice do better yet since he lauds our industry, and of food spoke graciously, doubly high our work rate we should set. Harvest bounty storage arts can the steward quickly show. Fifty storerooms, hundred carts, thus the calculations go. Harvest harder, he'll have wondered. Need more carts? Perhaps a hundred? Might a thousand be sufficient? No! Every storeroom is a hill, like a house each cart appears. Stewards getting richer still, better nourishment endears. Storerooms let him double then. Doubled be our tempo, men. Bring so much, he'll smile with joyful tears. <laughs> you know, I hope, I hope that is all sincere and not manufactured by some uh, reviser, yeah. you know? You know what I mean? Well, it, it certainly speaks of prosperity. Yes, he does that. Let's have another look at stewards. I like these stewards. Some of them are very okay. And if you work for them every day, you get to know them very well. Yes. Pay, uh, poem 246 on page 378 is called The Wine Steward. Okay. With gestures of polite regard, they seat themselves with kind exchange of bows. But once the folk are drinking hard, they overreach what custom wise allows. They quiet will no more espouse. They want to learn. They want to sing. They want to dance and leap and spring and everything that helps them to carouse. The steward's well positioned here. 
with careful helpers to support him too. And when the tempting liquid cheer has done its work, pray, what are they to do? He babbling hasn't kept in view that two loose tongues afar have roamed, since he himself is over foamed. <laughs> Why scold if we've had bottles not a few? <laughs> That somebody has been doing a little tattling. Huh, yes, you? yes. This is, these are wonderful. They're such glimpses of life. Aren't, isn't it like film clips from the really yes. good times? Yes. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to give you several poems about uh, the four bears. There's okay. four bear fest every year, at least one, seem to be several of them. There are so many recounts, accounts of them in his book. And uh, so here's a nice little intro to the subject. Uh, this is poem 317 on 496, oh, page 496. And it's called Four Bears Temple. This is where you go on specified days of the year to honor your ancestors, starting with your father, and proceeding to the father of the kingdom, the emperor. In forebear's temper, temple of the house of Chiyu, full seven tablets stand. The name of the or ancestral founder, Hiyu, is central and is grand. On tablets to the left and to the right, the names Wu Wang and Wen Wang greet your sight, whose regal deeds the best example would command. Of emperors, a long procession gains in death a harbor place, for all the names not room enough obtains, just for the fields of space. Each older name must to a younger yield, with altered words in each remaining field. Of three unchanged, the stars affirm eternal grace. You see, he's talking about here just a basic logistical problem. If you're going to have uh, the Father's Temple, and it's going to uh, uh, honor chiefly the, and above all, the primal fathers, the, the royal household. Uh, then uh, if you're honoring the, the latest seven, uh, by the time you accumulate three new ones, you, you will have to get rid of the three old ones. And here he's reassuring everybody that even if the human history has limited memory, Eternal memory does not fade. Problems that you have, but with, with clear solutions. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this is not far away on, this is pe poem 310. I like this one since I'm a musician. It's called Music at the Forebear Fest. Okay. Poem 310. The blind musician, okay. sorry. Got it. The blind musicians aptly skilled are in the royal halls. Blind vocalists with pleasure filled sing gently till he calls. In music pleasure room, ye cue, where colored feathers tower, the instruments, the tau, cha, chu, yu, and king adorn the bower. The drums are pounded, small and great, the tabrets and tambours, the fife and flute will mind elate and meadow reed allures. Each forebear these will gladly hear and people praise our fest. They relish all this time of cheer, then satisfied they'll rest. Nice. Nice to know about the music they add. I uh, I just heard a report about the Olympics, the Chinese Olympics, or the Olympics in China. Uh -huh. They described the music that was played the last time, and it was a lot of drums, apparently. Huh. Huh. Very stirring, but just... Huh. So they don't know how they're going to top it this time, I guess. <laughs> well, it's traditional to, to hail royalty with drums. I, Bach is not a great percussionist, J.S. Bach, but in his church cantatas, if it's a, if it's celebrating Jesus the King, uh, uh, or, or or some some festival involving triumph and victory in the lyrics, he'll introduce trumpets and drums. Well, we're now going on to uh, poem two hundred and seventy-one. 
Uh, 271 is a meal for death boy she. Now this is an interesting feature of uh, the four bear fest celebrations. Uh, the death boy is a, a teenager who has volunteered to be the emissary of the dead and the receiver of tribute gifts. And the tribute gifts are dishes of food and he tastes them and usually uh, he will like them, and if so, that promises an auspicious uh, uh, future. Because he's communicating, after all, uh, with the dead spirits who are receiving the gifts. On the river wave swims the tranquil swan. Why wine so bright you gave? Guest will come anon. Holding staff, he's near. Ah, the death boy's here. Goblet full may soon be gone. Into river wave dies the agile swan. More to guests you gave, fresh from pot, flacon. Blessed every gift, death boy's spirits lift, as if dishes more come on. Shining river shows, mirrored swan to all. Table guests you chose, fill the favored hall. Be by wealth endued, death boy likes the food. Four bears glad, good hat befall. Waves of river sway, swan in mild delight. Four bear rooms array, foods to charm the sight. Health be given you, death boy won't eschew foods that you've prepared aright. River calm and still, swan is floating now. Boy, no evil will in your house allow. Eating peacefully, pure good fortune he has proclaimed. We grateful bow. Nice, huh? Wouldn't you like to be the deaf boy? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, poem 169. I'd like to give you another, just to show you, it's very, they, these are uh, probably the primary festivals in this ancient Chinese culture. And so on 169, uh, you have a memorial feast for the dead. Okay. Enters the ancestral hall, the king, pure in body and devout in mind. Helpful servants, drink and food will bring for the holy ritual design. Smiles the death boy who'll receive these from people who believe, and his mild encouragements are kind. Those you're mindful of will think of you, from the heaven they in spirit see. Drink you'll have who were to fathers true, food you'll get who gave so plenteously. All the folk with hair not gray, hosts will sing your praise today. You are prized who prize true poetry. Sorry, I said poetry, and it says plain as day on the page. Piety. Right. Let the half moon be good fortune sign as it ripens toward the fuller sphere. May your gaze surveying land divine be a sun that rises bright and clear. Like Manshan, the mountain lone, towering high and rounded grown, be your realm, let round of earth revere. Full is your prosperity that flows, even as an independent spring, never withering the leaf that grows, as the mighty shaded pine, O king, hosts that chant your praise today, all the folk with hair not gray, grays and sated, greater praise will sing. Now here's an interesting thing. Uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about other aspects of Chinese life. We have celebrations, religious solemnities. And now I'd like to talk about a very important job that you, we don't think about too often. What about the postal service in the Chinese empire? Huh. Well, that, that amounts to mounted couriers. And the emperor sends lots of messages because he governs a big realm. And they don't get a whole lot of rest. There's a, a, a remarkable number of soliloquies of, on page 348 the imperial courier. Okay. Glowing summer heat means the day is long. Evil no defeat 
knows the plague is strong, while the others rest in shade. On my way, I'm weary made, bringing regal news to distant throng. Autumn breath beware, threatened leaves on trees. Raw and chilly air warns me, speed, not ease. Others ripened fruit may choose. I, my duty, can't refuse. Move with withered leaves along the leaves. Withered wi winter winds that mar every field and mead. Storms you bringing are heralds we must heed. Traveling as I must roam while the others rest at home. Wind and storm evading well indeed. Changing, murky, pure, flows the valley stream, beds unblocked, assure, mirror clear twill gleam. Yet my stream that stirs the mind is by worry stern confined, never leaving time to sleep and dream. Seaward, as with power, River Kyung will stream, bearing every hour waters fresh that teem. So I hourly bring letters from the king that concern him deeply, it would seem. Seaward, as with power, River Kyung flows clear, bearing every hour streams that disappear. Each decree that I unfold vanishes at doors of gold. Nothing of reward I'll ever hear. Mm. So I remember learning that the Persian Empire had one of the first postal services, but I bet what you're saying, I mean, I know this isn't poetry exactly, but China must have had one earlier. Well, it looks that way to me. Yeah. China is an awfully old place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's an interesting thing. Let's have another uh, at some problems that appear in ancient Chinese life. This is poem 112 on 203. Okay. And it's called Annoyances of Life at Court. <laughs> the short poem, it can quickly be summed up. Through the empty spaces wanders each at peace. Berry tree one faces, sing to feel release. Why our forces do we yoke, serving such unworthy folk? Let us leave and let the labor cease. In its native places, people leave the steer, where the plowman traces, rose, no fame, no fear. Irksome work, day in, day out, where a seed will never sprout. Time to quit. Let's go together, dear. Simple meals they eat. Frugal is the fare. Life confined is sweet, led without a care. Working here to serve the state, burdens life and earns our hate. Come, for independence, let's prepare. <laughs> I kind of, uh, what runs through my mind is, you'll be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the primitive life isn't all that great, huh? Uh -huh. Or isn't, it depends. It can or, or it may or may not be. Right. Hmm. Well, I think there will always be city people and country people. Yes, yes. Here's one I enjoy. This is poem 57, The Border Guard, uh, 138, page 138. Okay. Here we're talking about people who defend the borders. How does a sample sentry feel? Seated on a mountain stone, hero strikes the bronzen cup, waking, sleeping, stays alone, foe to face, not giving up, says, my oath will this entail, I will perish ere I fail, enemies to countervail. 
on the rising mountain slope, hero strikes the bronzen cup. All that hear this tone have hope. Courage lives, no giving up. Worthy he affirmed instead, never will barbaric tread be athwart the border led. On the mountain ridge's height, hero strikes the bronzen cup. Foe, however high your might, hear the tone, we won't give up. Speaks to you the heaven sign of a hero's strength divine. None this realm shall undermine. Hmm. Nice, huh? Yeah. Yes. There's it a is. happy soldier. Yes, yes. Well, he has a he has a philosophy of life. He does. Mm. And now, poem eighteen interests me a lot. I, I give it interpretation. Uh, it's on page eighty. I think my numbers are different. Poem eighteen. Uh, poem eighteen is. Uh, I'll tell you what it's on. Oop. Eight oh. Yeah, Page eight um, in this Kindle book, poem 18 is on 65. That'll be fine. Yep. Now this I like, uh, let's make, uh, I'll, I'll stop and uh, try to uh, give a possible interpretation. This is called the emperor's high priest robe. Mm. It says in England, the, the king or queen is the head of the church too. I saw the emperor standing at the right with each priestly gem. The world entire I could see in that rich vestment he wore with them. Gold sun embroidered upon the right, at left was the argent moon. On sky blue vestment were sewn the bright star sparkles that heaven illumed. As if on body of heaven space, the earth orb upon his head. Grass, trees on cap with a crown like grace, to thinking of springtime led. Aren't trees and grasses the proper thing with nourishing ears of wheat for kingly annual offering that heavenly sphere hymns greet? Mm. I, th I think the reason he likes it is that it's not only a beautiful combination of colors on the high priest robe, but it, it's cosmic, right? It's uh, all the different heavenly bodies. Yes, yeah. Everything worth depicting to show the unity mm. of the universe. And yes. I think that uh, the poet probably identifies with this because he's trying to bring to alive the world of ancient China, right? Give you 325 people who you thought might be uh, silent just because they're dead. It's, mm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun to think of that, for me at any rate. Mm. Well. That's an interesting description of the hat. Yeah, I mean, I've that. seen I've seen those hats before. The earth orb on his head. I think it's one of those hats that have a little circle in the front. Oh, uh, so, so, sounds like ancient Egypt, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. This is fascinating. Well, now I have a little uh, section of a few poems that I call characterizations and conflicts. These are soliloquies. You get to see something of the personality of the uh, of the speaker, and at the same time, it's uh, uh, thoughts about the social scene generally. Okay. This on poem two twenty four. Which is page three forty six. Okay, and uh, the title. Yeah, did Distribution yes. of wealth, okay. and imme Im immediately the title suggests to you, does it not, that mm -hmm. problems in all these centuries, uh, no matter which big country you live in, and uh, perhaps haven't changed. Yes. Much. Made whetstone smooth is all the royal street, more straight and more direct than arrow flight. The princes ride thereon with horses ever fleet. Processions are a common sight. Yet eyes, however far their gaze extend, may nothing see but want without an end. Our Eastern Empire shows the looms are bare. Each warp and woof are missing or outworn, stilled spools with nothing there. 
the long-awaited threads of hope are torn. In linen shoes the rich walk fast and free. What comfort for the poor man can there be? The grasses moan are quickly drawn away. One doesn't let them wither in the field. But after work the sighs outweigh the sleep to which the reapers need to yield. The grasses rest within their granaries. Will someone guide our effort, grant us ease? Our Eastern workers' burdens find more ponderous than humans can endure. Silk, damask, taffeta must come to mind, and fur-trimmed coats which wealthy folk procure. Some folk that once were to be oarsmen born, high places of great honor now adorn. Be sure their wines no medicine will be. And if with gem and pearl their garments gleam, they nothing in the least objectionable see. To them must these but sand and gravel seem. The only other things that stream such light appear within the Milky Way at night. The maiden fine in silks arrayed gave nothing of her charming garb to me. The steer that for the rider stayed, I won't to cart be harnessing, pardee. And those that southward bring the winnow gold contain what won't to simple folk be sold. Big Dipper, with its handle facing west, I cannot fill with food that satisfies. A radiant vision game at best. For empty pots, a compensation prize. Fine decoration made of heaven fire. No object meant for common desire. And that's, so that's a time of social upheaval, I think, isn't it? Must be. It must truly be. Yeah. yeah. Very different than the others where they're talking about work, but prosperity. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Of change. I don't trace all that in my book. I didn't have time or space or skill. But the yeah. sinologists, you can find plenty of reference books, which will uh, um, give you context of that kind, which would be useful. Would you even know when that particular poem was written? Nope. No, I wouldn't think so. And one reason is that Rückert himself, the, in the version that he got from La Charme, the French Jesuit Latin prose writer, found all kinds of detailed information, and a lot of it he just ignored. And some of it he chose to incorporate into a poem. And every now and then he'd find such an interesting fact in Latin that he'd make it into a new poem of his own and give it his own. Oh, yeah. So he, he was very free about that. Basically, the man wants to introduce you to ancient Chinese people. It's a it's a, a kind of translation not to, not in vogue at all right now. Yes, yeah. But fun to think about. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it really is. I I, we so we had Shakespeare Club today, and uh, while we're waiting for uh, Cymbeline to start, we were talking. And um, Eve Berman's mother is oh, going to be a hundred. Ah, so we talked about her life, how she escaped from Germany just in the nick of time. Mm. But her parents didn't, and you know things like that. And I thought these are slices of life. Ruth Levy's father had tuberculosis and they settled in Saranac Lake, things like that. It's like, those will disappear. It's so wonderful to have these poems. Yes. Well, if you, we're on this theme now, getting uh, pretty involved in it, shall we try one that really uh, uh, gives you a clear sense of upheaval? This, this one is number 212 okay. and it is called Persecuted. Uh, that's on, on page two, 331. My pages are different, but um, I can go, go by the number of the poem. I've got it. Good, good. The ravens over ranges fly. A steady beat their winged flapping can maintain. Then tranquil afterward, they land upon the plain. Have others luck? I must in mourning lie. 
Why, heaven, do I merit pain? Why has my heart been broken? Look, in pounding woe that fever shook, Twill wretched in relentless torment cook. The royal street in motion strayed, Will go but badly overgrown with forest weed. The plants that here advance don't plow or hoeing need. An eyes made heavy by a terror weight, While desolation thought will feed, in sheet I'm wound, my death at hand, and sigh and nothing understand, who years have aged from inner fever brand. I'm staring at the berry trees, that each were planted by my parents' worthy hands. My deep respect with awe-filled trembling understands. I to remembered space am born with ease. When they complied with child demands, they're gone, the pious and the kind, and left me here with troubled mind. To direst times I must become resigned. In evening when the willow sways, the creekside branches where the shrill cicadas sing, where slender bent grass stems to one another cling, and silken water pearls in limpid way. The dusk is hemmed with golden ring. I sway as in a little boat, so weak upon the waves I float, yet nothing know of streamlet or of moat. The stag is like the morning star, from woods approaching as it strides before the herd. A golden pheasant is on dewy treetop stirred, who's calling his beloved spouse afar. I feel I must appear absurd. A rotting tree trunk I appear. Not suckled by the cloud nurse, dear, but smoldering with glow that's known by no one near. A hare that from the hunter flees, hopes that the gardener some empathy might show. Perhaps a wanderer were, will bury soon in woe the corpse that in the wood he sudden sees. A high-rank man who thinks me low resents me in his secret mind. My faithfulness no praise might find, yet penury might earn some thought that's kind. That man will drink with eager ear and greedy any slander's rumor may have wrought, while quaffing what the able taverner has brought from juicy plants fermented pure and clear. What vile distinctions he was taught. He lets not caring what ensues, the guilty man his favor use, but grace will to the innocent refuse. The man who plans to fell a tree and then will choose with care the axe he deems might suit, had better think a bit before he strikes the root to put his foot where twill not injured be or else he'll pluck some bitter fruit. To lumberman it may appear some better vein of wood is near or he may cut against the grain, I fear. One hill is high, another shorter. When shallow is the fountain, water's hard to hoist. Don't fish within my waters, they are barely moist. Let's stand each weakened bridge support her. What obstacles are looming large with desperate strength can I oppose? But what the future will disclose, I cannot help. Let heaven be in charge. Mm. Well, I think it would be nice to have something very positive. And one of the, the most heartening things that I've read is poem 166. Okay. <laughs> in two, praise six, of brothers? Praise, in praise of brothers. Okay. I've never read a poem quite like this. As cherry never bloomed so bright, another kind of tree. Deer lift their heads to noble height, no creature mind so free. Than all the people old as you, a brother has a love more true. Who else is like him? <clears throat> Who? On battlefield, 
one may behold what brother love can do. Where bodies of the soldiers bold, one must with horror view. Alone the brothers running swift, the loved one's body will he lift and bear to burial rift. The eagle builds an airy high that hardiness commends. He's blessed that trusts a brother nigh and not false party friends. A brother may a rescue dare while friends will utter reft of care, laments to empty air. A brother won't forget that he on mother's breast with you had rested and would later be your friend in pleasures true. But those whom later you had known took different roads, and you alone in solitude might moan. Though brothers on occasion quarrel within their father's hall, they, Ashlar's strong in duty moral, defy invaders all. Should enemy a threat aver, your brother kens what may occur. False friends will never stir. One honors brother when in need, so long as dangers last. If peace return, then first indeed we deem the peril past. If more appealing should appear, another face than brothers, here arise surprises drear. When timed with the ancestral fest, the home adornment shows, and fiddles fit, and lyre played best, and wine libation flows. If brother loved be standing by, and none hide grudge behind a sigh, all souls are lifted high. When wife and children in accord are harmonies enjoyed, let none who thus can reap reward by brother be annoyed. But if the brother lift his voice with wife and children to rejoice, heaven kens no better choice. Then if your home be governed so, delighting wife and child, in joy you slowly old will grow, not fluttered, rushed, but mild. If prudent reason be your guide, and wisely you by that abide, you'll find I haven't lied. Huh. Mm. Yes. It's nice. It could be in any age. That's so true. Yeah. Uh, poem 218, I chose because it talks not about brothers, but about friends. And it, he, these friends, one of them wants to be a, a, a brotherly friend, in, but the other one, he does, he, he's not very happy about uh, the estrangement that has occurred uh, between mm -hmm. uh, him and that other one. Uh, anyway, this is a psychology and very, very interesting. And I really like the speaker. This is called Friends at Odds. Who is it that like wind a whirl beside my startling home is roaring by? Do you from north or south your storm unfurl? Can you no word exchange with such as I? I'm sure you have time to visit me. Yet note how slow is your approach, a crawl. When halfway here, you halt, I see. With oil, you smear wheel, spoke, and axle, all. You want to stop a while? If so, my heartfelt welcome take. But if you're too much on the go, explain, why can't good feeling reawake? A pair of brothers once we were, who'd harmonize and rarely fight. The older would the barbiton prefer, the younger liked the fiddle bright. Two threads of different colors were we then, together making up a vivid chord. We made each other more attractive men. So what untuned the harmony that soared? I promise what I'll say is true. I didn't start the enmity. You credited things said of me. I put no trust in what I'd heard of you. Hmm. Gee, that's, yeah. that's a short story, isn't it? It is. It is. Well, this third section of mine is called Love, Rewards and Discontents. Okay. So we can do moods of all kinds re um, relating to relationships between two people. I like poem number 94.
I remember falling in love and feeling just like this. This mm -hmm. is called, it's called, it's nine, number 94 is called Chance. New Poland plants will claim in field a dewy fest. I'll mention not her name of maiden's loveliest. Together, there we were. It happened just by chance. Yet long ago, romance had set our flames a whir, and now my heart belonged to her. The oaks in forest grow, and bitter fruit they bear. The sign I needn't show of man well-bred and rare. We found each other there. It never had been planned. By destiny's demand, we for each other care. May nothing spoil my joy so fair. <laughs> That's amazing. It's nice. Feels like everything has been working in his favor. Although yeah. he does have slight uneasy. Anything so good, can it keep lasting? You know, right. just, oh, the oak, it, oaks, oaks uh, give uh, acorns, which are, he's, he yeah. says, he says bitter, though some people make an appetizing stew out of them. Yes. And then he says, the sign I needn't show of man well-bred and rare, I don't have to put on shows for her. She knows who I am. I don't, at least that I don't have to worry about. Yeah. And it, let's see. Uh, yeah, he feels it's all faded. Yeah, faded. Yeah. This is an interesting one. I've changed my interpretation about this quite a lot. Um, uh, uh, number 52 is called Faithful Unto Death. You got that? Uh, 52. Yeah, I it's do. Right near the beginning. Yeah. Faithful Unto Death. On solemn oath, a seal I set. My woe I'll cease not to forget, and rather death would choose than say, I do, on second wedding day. My mother counsel interjects, I thank her, duty so directs. To her be laud and blessing brought, yet me she comprehended not. On solemn oath a seal I set, my woe I'll cease not to forget. And rather death would choose than say, I do on second wedding day. So, get that. Is He's that a something? widower. Yes. Not going to marry again. Not going to marry again. You yeah. know, my first my first reaction, maybe I've become too cynical from living so long, but I thought yeah. she does he doesn't, whoever it is is, doesn't want to say I do a second time because it had enough the first time around. <laughs> But then I went back to it and I said, you, Martin, are reading this like a 21st century skeptical urban American. <laughs> well, could be, but I, I'd go for more. He uh, He's not going to make a big deal about it, but he's not going to get married again. That's not, that's true. I believe him. Yeah. Oh, here's a very interesting one. It's so short, and you, there's a whole lot is packed into this with such skill. This is uh, number 93, and it's called Expectation. He that on his garment bright has a hem as black as gloom fills my heart with sorrow's might till for light there's no more room. True to visit you in woe, I won't go. My affliction, though, to mend, it would help me if you'd greeting send. He, upon his garment bright, has a hem as black as gloom. Yet the gem of love's delight, he can still my dreams illume. True to visit you in woe, I won't go, since my life constraint must claim. It would be a boon if soon you came. So, uh, hem as black as bloom, is that a mourning thing, a device of mourning? Uh, that's a, uh, it's mourning for her, definitely. Yeah. As to whether it was intended to be mourning for somebody else, I have no idea. 
I do notice in reading a lot of uh, what's widely called Oriental poetry, Persian, verse written in Persian over the centuries, uh, a lot of symbolic weight is placed upon the hem of a garment. Uh, okay. Yeah. Dare I touch the hem of, hem of so-and-so's garment? <laughs> That's the... Yes, uh, yes, yes. That kind of thing is very often... Yeah. This is fa fascinating to me because it's so intimate and subtle. She does would love so much to see this man because her husband pays her no attention at all. Uh, but um, oh, I thought. But it. I not... thought it was someone who had lost someone, and didn't want to bring everybody else down, but on the other hand, wants a visit. Isn't that interesting? That's quite quite possible, as particularly in view of the the idea of a hem as a as a funeral garb, mm. the, the black hem. Your interpretation may be more more accurate. I know. It's good though. It, it, it's <laughs> it nice is. that she she's so considerate of both what yes. her social duties can yes. require and and what she yes. does for her friend. Yes. Now let's see. Uh, Number 148, I have marked. 148. No, this is, a, this is another of those uh, subtle things in where, where a lot's said in a few words. I want to thank you for the interpretation of that last one. It has, I think, quite permanently changed my viewpoint. Well, it, it might be, no, might not be right, but, um, well, it's so... They're so rich and full of um, the everyday, but also emotion. Yeah. But there, and you it, made you made more out of the out of the hem than I did, and and I think it's significant that how you did it. Uh, number four, one forty eight, by moonlight. The rising moon's a gleam with light. A man with features clear and bright can take my grief away. Alone in care, I shake and sway. The rising moon can radiant shine. A man with nature kind and fine, my sorrow may repel. Alone must I in dolor dwell. The moon has mild, consoling rays. Dear husband, your restoring gaze. Oh, I am overjoyed. Alone I be by woe destroyed. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yes, it is. You know, that is very much in tune with uh, with this book as a whole, because there's quite a lot of celebration by uh, a celebration of wives by their husbands and of husbands by their wives. Yes. I have read more uh, Testament of a Happy Marriage poems in here than in any other collection. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, this is so full of a the everyday, I guess you'd say, the normal, but seems very accessible. Could could happen to anyone, could be anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, let's see, uh, poem 149. Oh, this is a powerful one. Okay. A restless night. Mm. The water lily on the lake to blossom grows. A handsome man, my heart made ache, and ah, oh, my woes. Where shall I turn and whither wend? In sleep and vigil there's no end, in evening or in morning. To sorrows long aborning and tears that weary eyes will lend. Of water lilies on the pond, the umbles bloom. For him, my heart went far beyond accustomed gloom. The way his tresses richly hung adown his cheeks, my heart has wrung. In dreaming or awake, myself must I betake some other where that never poet sung. The water lilies on the flood have opened wide. Oh, dearest friend, I wish you could with me abide. 
your clearest light from brightest eyes, all sleep of mine each night denies. I turn from side to side, desire, delight, defy, then face in pillow hide until I rise. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's so she's so far deep in love. She it really hurts. Yes, she does. Yeah, or maybe she's what did they used to call that? Infatuated. Yep. Got a crush. Yes. Well, infatuated is a crush is better because she's really crushed. Yeah. But inf infatuated is. Uh, it pays not to know too much about the word. It comes from Latin fatuus, a fool. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we know what, we each know what the other means by the words. Yes, yes. Uh, let's see here. This is kind of nice. Uh, this won't get you so so deep in, in, in people's intimate feelings. This is um, more descriptive. And uh, I like that. This is number 58 called At the Rent at the entry of the royal bride. Hmm. In the cheerful part of the book, I notice on the facing pages, the border guard about the, the proud century with the philosophy of life that we read before. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Well, the farmer's kind of cheerful too. Which? The farmer and the- Oh, the far Oh, way down yeah. at the, at the yeah. beginning, we had lots of yeah. cheerful prosperity. Yeah, yeah. At, at the entry of the royal bride, Daughter the, of a king, majestic is the bride, and her brother too a king you'll find. Queens are both her sisters, who've in beauty vied, king the one who's kissing her, so kind. Splendid as a tree in silken leaves inwound, swells her height and her expansive mood. Branch-like Elegance in well-formed hand is found, tinted fingernails with bloom endued. Limpid her complexion, milky white, twill win admiration from beholder's gaze. When she kindly smiles, her lovely lips begin, vernal day that will a fragrance raise. Darksome brows more graceful than the butterflies, teeth we liken to the seeds of gourd. When to white blue heaven shine her dark brown eyes, stars appear to gleam to be adored. Steeds that draw the chariot their necks will raise, high and proud, the regal bride to bear. Her enamored realm that she serene surveys, captivated by her fetters fair. Mm -hmm. Fetters chains, she has, in other words, captured them. Ah, thank Captiv you. captivated. I was picturing, I was picturing the fetters on her, but no, you're right. That is what she did. She captured them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. They're wearing the fetters yeah. and gladly. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So that that I really enjoyed. Yeah, certainly describes a scene, and you can see it. You know, you can, and it's a scene from. Almost pre-recorded history, I guess. That's true, and the, the unalloyed, uh, uh, near worship of the queen or yeah. the, prin the princess is really quite uh, quite something to behold. But it yeah. must have been powerful. Yeah, there's still millions of people who like to read about Queen Elizabeth a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> what you don't want to know about Meghan and Harry? <laughs> There's one called uh, The Queen's Warsaw. Now we're on the theme of queens. It's quite interesting. What number? This is also got a lot of description, but a bit of psychological subtlety too. This is number 135. It's called The Queen's Warsaw. Okay. okay. Show John, they call the chariot of war. From best of Xiao tree wood, tis firmly made. Five sliding layers of bronze to have. What's more, embroidered pillows on the seats are laid. The horse's reins can play within the rings. 
by which they're led or left more slackened, free. Past hill and valley roll the wheels, each sings. Would I were granted wings to fly with them, they move so rapidly. Each horse's neck and shoulders bear a crest, their white and shining thighs we gleaming see. That man of mine's more cultured than the rest, and brilliant as a precious jewel he. He moves, he's sworn to live no more indeed, within the home where we have wedded stayed. He's in a hut that's thatched with grass and reed. On watch, he'll pay no heed on to me, but when he's gone, must my joy must fade. The steeds at either side are flaming red. The middle pair are darker brown in hue. Six reins he'll use to guide four horses tread, or sometimes one commanding word will do. Two reins for every side horse, and the pair between them each require a single rein. Past hill and vale, each harness glimmers fair. If I had wings, I'd dare to fly behind and reach the fighting plane. Each vehicle, two shields must have, well formed. One shield is placed behind and one ahead. The crests are each with dragon head adorned. One mild, the other strikes defiers dead. The dragon at the head will scorn the foe. The one behind looks kindly on the land, and as it turns when once the fiends laid low, how mild the face twill show to us, and woe is gone as by command. Hmm. That, that's got a lot in it. Oh, it does. It, that to me could be right out of a, out of a Shakespeare play. Marvelous yeah. soliloquy. She totally adores the chariot and she's deeply in love, I think, with her royal husband. He's just the very best and she says so. But then yeah. uh, he's been doing nothing, but I guess he's staying out with the, with the builders or the, the chariot makers or the troops. Uh, and he lives in some kind of a hut and he leaves her alone at night. So, yeah, he won't stay in their house. It's as if he's like, a, well, I suppose the Spartans do it all along, but he's preparing himself fasting and everything to go to war. Like, it's like that. I think that's very acute. I think yeah. that's quite precisely said. Yeah, he, a, a Spartan war cult and she bears the consequences. And I read about the Vikings. They had dragon heads on their boats. Uh-huh. But yes. they would take them off when they were not Viking. Because, uh. <laughs> whatever, because they didn't want to scare the spirits of the land. And in his and in the queen's chariot, the, the dragon looking behind is kindly. Uh-huh. And the dragon ahead, maybe riding to war, is fierce. I don't know. That's, if that's, that's very good. That's very good. Yeah. That Viking tie-in is very nice with the smiling on the land. Yeah, yeah. Toward the land. Well, they believed in the spirits of the land. So oh, sure. maybe, maybe they did too. Yes. Okay. It's interesting. It's so, so complex that it, they would include battle preparations and her feelings uh, but that's very many-sided isn't it it gives you the yes. same kind of a uh, pleasant shock uh, that that i get at least when reading homer and i yeah. discover that it's there's so much that is so perfect and hasn't been excelled and yeah. done so very long ago yeah yeah this is when i was coming up the stairs after the break i thought could this be a fake? Could he have made this up in 1890 something? Because it sounds so contemporary, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want, and I don't believe it's a fake, and I certainly don't want to, because I, I like the idea that you can connect to someone who lived all those thousands of years ago. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, he's a very open-minded man. He led a very full life, not at all in the Spartan kind. He always had at least 10 kids with him when he went to church every Sunday. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, 
uh, he wrote it, you know, he's the author of the texts also used by Mahler, uh, Songs of the Deaths of Children. Oh. One year, two of his children died within the same year, and he buried them both on his lawn, in his lawn with, with his own hands. Oh, my. And uh, he wrote, uh, in order to get rid of the impression, uh, in order to get rid of the depression that was weighing on him, he put himself through an intensive course of poetry therapy. Mm. He wrote hundreds of poems on the deaths of children. Wow. And Mahler only, only selected, what is it, half a dozen? Hundreds. There's nothing like it in world literature that I have ever heard of. So he can put himself in, in uh, 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 all kinds of states of mind. I have already translated another whole book. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I made it a book. Um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's only. Uh, it's less than twenty percent of what he wrote. It's called um, uh, wisdom, "Wisdom of the Brahmin." Anyway, uh, where are we? Uh, we we just finished the Queen's War Song. Yes. No. But we we were discussing something. Oh yes, so just... uh, Rickert and uh, mm -hmm. and his children. Uh, yes, and he wrote a po poem called uh, "The Weisheit des Brahman" and "Wisdom of the Brahman." And uh -huh. he, he says the Brahman is a man who studies no no Veda, no no scripture but nature. And you know oh. that this is going to be a spokesman for Rickert himself. He translated the Koran, left mm -hmm. leaving out the legislative passages and putting in all the the episodes, the incidents, the good parts. And it's masterly mm -hmm. today. I I love it. And he translated uh, Eastern scriptures. And he translated Indian, Persian, and Arabian poems. That's another book of mine. You may yeah. tell that I am a member, if not the uh, not a founder. <laughs> <laughs> of the, of the uh, Rickard Rickard fan, fan club. club. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, let's see. Well, here's here's a, a very moving poem. I think it's valuable for that. Uh, it, it's quite special in in having achieved that. Uh, it's a it's called um, plaint of no yes plaint of a wife unloved, and it is uh, number twenty six. He's very sympathetic to women throughout the book. Very empathetic. The queen who's watching the chariot and thinking about how she's left alone by a Spartan king. I mean, that, that's a remarkable yeah. thing. And yeah. here, too, here too, the empathy is amazing. This is in four sh uh, short sections and the, the music keeps changing. If you've noticed, I'm, I'm sure how musical these things are. Uh, yeah. I feel I'm singing sometimes, and, and I even consciously add a, bit, a certain pitch now and then. Mm. And I, you don't know it by just by watching the screen, but I'm keeping time also. Okay. <laughs> okay, plaint, plaint of a wife unloved. On the wave, a swaying skiff goes not how and where it will, but when it's impelled and if ordered size remaining still. Victim to the nudge and shove, the semi of one I love. In this bond I so am caught, though I know he loves me not. Shall I to my brothers wail that my husband injures me? They'll reply, it cannot fail. You his faithful wife must be. Ah, from brothers rent away. Parents too she can't gainsay, who, though once her man she won, felt his lack of friendship stun. Never is my mood a mirror open, laughing to the day, nor a stone that someone near her carries from the hill away, nor a rug that under feet anyone may come and beat. By the plumb line, conduct rule, I endure his rigor school. Lives of women unfulfilled, I bewail, not just my own. How a heart love deep to build on a heart more cold than stone. She, the one disgraced, made ill, sulken, sunken in affliction still, feels a reawakened pain, and in sleep her heart complain. Shining altar sun and moon, gold and silver ornament. Yet I can't exchange my doom with delight, pure sorrow's lent. If I see and sigh out breathed, quite bedimmed the life that seethed. Yet so light, no breath will be as the one that death can free. Coat of a springtime green. 
yellow my hidden frock. Outward the bauble seen, sorrow of heart must mock. Coat of a springtime green, yellow my hidden frock. Woe of my heart unseen, lies under gem bright lock. Moon and sun may light bestow on the ardent earth toward them turned. From my spouse, why can't there flow streams of love at home where heart has yearned? Holding custom up to scorn, he from normal living torn deems my love a burden to be spurned. Moon and sun will give their light to the earth that on them both depend. But the husband with despite turns from her whose yearning never ends. Can my gaze him drive away? Close a blinded eye today when he sees how love my soul befriends. Moon and sun will every day rise from ancient place and triumph raise. Heal the course ordained, beray nature framed. He lawful right betrays. Wayward and infirm he'll stay, and my yearning turn away, that for better refuge daily prays. Moon and sun awake, arise ever from the selfsame heaven place. Parents, why do you despise my entreaty for protective grace? You've entrusted me to one who is neither night nor sun, vacillating, shadow-hiding face. Daily wafts the breeze, while I on my husband gaze, such my great unease, that it seems he mocking plays. Then my sorrow doubly will displease, doubly real the, gr the grief he'll raise. Ah, the winds will blow, dust had filled the stirring air, now to me he'll go, wrath forgetting, done with care. But he halfway halts, and now I grow, as I have to watch him standing there. When the winds blow free, cover clouds the pleasant play. Skies have been for me, doubly clouded now today. Prospect none of comfort can I see. Bear me sighs with winds away. Mm. Yes, this is almost a uh, an abused wife, and she uh, almost, almost a what? An abused, abused. Yes, an abused wife. Yes, I yeah. wish my my ear, hearing were a little better. Uh, oh, you, yeah. speak, you speak clearly, but rather softly. Uh, I do. I do. An abused wife. That's the subject of the poem. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, what caught my attention was something she said about um, rigor. Yes, yes. Uh, that's uh, uh, at the bottom of stanza three in part one. By the plumb line, conduct rule, I endure his rigor school. A plumb yeah. line is an architectural tool used in building. Yes, yes. Yes. And that means he lays down the law and he draws the line. Yes, yes. And uh, it's awful disapproving. Everything has to be right to the fraction of an inch. Yes, yes. My gosh. I, so I really do hope these are from long, long ago because it just, it's a little heartening that people haven't changed. In a way, you know. It's, yes, it's, that's a good point. It's it, it's perfect. What you you sometimes say things what's in ways that seem to you just word perfect because they're uh, uh, heartening because we're not alone. Yeah, yeah. We don't. We aren't living through a particularly uh, hideous kind of uh, era of the world. Try some others. <laughs> I know, I know. Is that how fate uh, doles things out here and there and yeah. in ways that never have been very well uh, yeah. accounted for or, or necessarily yeah. approved? Yeah. All right. Now, you have brought up the theme about uh, how it can be heartening to know that you're, you're not the first person to have gone through this. And uh, so, therefore, I think it might be nice to turn at this point 
to a, a, a poem that, uh, how shall we say, deals with climate change. Oh, all right. It's a, it's a climate crisis poem. Uh, it's poem 295. It's almost near the end. Okay. Okay. Yep. And it's called what else? <laughs> Nationwide <laughs> drought. Yes. And Ch China's a big place. Mm. The green sward, drier than was ever known. Above, the Milky Way untroubled course will run. The sighing emperor cries forth his moan. Oh, people of this time, what monstrous thing you've done. The heaven let us feel its lethal might. We've raised our prayers, penitential vows in front. We find no sign of heaven's heart in sight. The fields are drier than was ever known. No moisture dew, the desert breezes each on fire. Abroad in vain are clouds of sighing shown. With here in vain. The wearied incense climbing higher. In hut and palace, votive candles burn. With bowls of non-stop offering outworn, we yearn. Already, sorry, away unanswered winds their currents turn. The acres, drier than was ever known. No wizard can the withering of earth dispel. The lightning still, no thunder rain has sown. Yet we, twixt thunder, lightning, sway in baleful spell. The pallid dawn seems not to heed. O father of our line, we see, perceive our need. Thrice honored forebears, are you deaf indeed? The meadows drier than was ever known. On land plot, never cheerful greening leaf is seen. Some refuge men and cattle seek alone. In shadowed wood, no shade the faded trees between. From all directions, dreadful grief wails flee. The weakened cry afar, the dying near I see. As if a remedy were here with me. The mangers, drier than was ever known. No leaf on mountainside, in stream no water drop. One sea of heat, the air, no shore twill own. Within my cauldron heart, the awful heat won't stop. He's blessed who thwart ocean race. For all the heaven guardians forsake this place. And I'm bereft, deprived of needed grace. The regions, drier than was ever known. I wish I had a hint what our offense might be. Why heaven wrath so murderous had grown. What ill of ours aroused this wretched penalty? Why blessing will our furrows never swell? When us to offerings deep pieties impel, and to gifts of dedicated labor tell. The realms are drier than was ever known. We, disciplined, obeyed, yet every arrow sank. The lords, their servants, who have faithful grown, can't rescue, though their grateful hearts for labor thank. The worker in the kitchen or the stall, the guard of resting chamber or of outer wall, their fates, like that of master, must appall. The green sword, drier than was ever known. To heaven, to the sparkling stars, we lift our eyes. Officials offer with a mournful tone, with lifted arms, alarmed entreaties that arise. Let never fall, dear souls, your faithful hand, but pray as I do, pray, oh, pray, as fates command. For me, don't pray. Oh, no, but pray for this, our land. It's really good. 
That's very good. That is. <laughs> I'm glad I was given this poem. I really feel, as you say, a uh, certain common uh, legacy or, or, yeah. or uh, dower from nature. Yes. Yeah, this sense of helplessness. and Exactly. Whatever we yeah. do that improves our lot, worsens yeah. it also. Every time we open up a door to to unexpected good, it turns out there's a little worm in the apple and devil <laughs> hiding behind. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. It doesn't, in California, I would go out there a lot when my mother was alive. They were in a drought for probably 10 years at least, I think. Mm -hmm. Really a 10 year drought. Long drought, yeah. Well, what's the Bible full of except stories of uh, of drought and then the yeah. comes, comes the rain? Yeah. Yeah. Drought. Well, uh, I think I'm going to end. Okay. With a, Thank with, you. With Thank you for your patience. With poem number 303. Oh, okay. All right. Because I'd yep. like something, I'd like uh, to end with something a little calmer and more reassuring. This okay. is num number 303 is prayer. Okay. And it's subtitled Prayer of the Child Emperor Ching Wang, son of Wen Wang. The heavens leadership is hid. The council high and wondrous made. When one of earthly conflict rid, looks kindly down on field and glade. At dawn, his land amid, he'll heart's view light arrayed. Oh, let my forebear's favor stay. His mentor aid I'll try to use. Can wisdom filled with love portray? that I, this land, may never lose. Oh, let me make my way to you, nor help refuse. Hmm. He's praying to his father, the late emperor. Yes. Yes. I think that's nice to close. I with. think that is. <laughs>